Well, the pace of the book of Kings really accelerates in 2 Kings chapter 15. The constant failure and rebellion of God's chosen people seems to have exhausted the patience of our narrator. Uh, the pattern it is unrelenting now. Judah's kings, they do right up to a certain point, but they cling on to the sins of the high places, which are an affront to the Lord their God. Israel's kings, they are calf-worshipping idolaters who persist in doing evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord still sends some prophets to warn them and to call them back to repentance and faith, but it seems that precious few are listening. And chapter after chapter has been the same old, same old story in so many ways. And so the pace now picks up. The narrator seems to be in a hurry to get to the end now. Well, how will it all end? What will the conclusion of be of all this, you know, failure and sin? We want to know, because as we read on through this book, chapter by chapter, we surely know this much. God will not let this rebellion go on forever. And two aspects of that rebellion are highlighted in this fast-moving chapter. Pride and prejudice. Pride in Judah, prejudice in Israel. We'll look at them in turn. And there is a third one coming. First of all, pride. Uh, Pride in Judah's kings. Azariah, also called Uzziah, and Jotham. That's how the chapter begins and ends. Uh, Azariah's pride, verses 1 to 7. Jotham's pride in verses 32 to 36. And we're really going to stick mostly with Azariah just tonight. And on a positive note, Azariah, he, he does the right thing in the sight of the Lord. It's written there in verse 3. And while this is a, a positive and a good thing for the nation, for his 52 years on the throne, he sort of can't help but see that doing some things right is a dangerous thing. It's dangerous because it seems they're content with a little righteousness. And the little righteousness never enough I think there's something of the Pharisees in how Judah is being governed they're doing many things right they're keeping the worship of God going at the temple for a start Uh, they're keeping the feasts and so on the day of atonement comes around every year sacrifices are made all the time this is good these things are done at God's command at God's instruction And Azariah and Jotham, both of them, obey the Lord. And that is, of course, good. And God sees this obedience, and God is pleased with obedience. And they themselves, to a degree, they can be pleased with that obedience. However, their obedience in some things, Obedience, even perhaps in the main things, should never be the end of the story. They ought to pursue pursue obedience in every aspect of their own lives and in the life of the nation. But they simply don't. They seem to have sort of, you know, ticked the box regarding the worship of God. Yeah, we do these things. That'll keep him happy. But they fail to see that that is where their own true happiness lies. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But they seem to have missed that. They're missing that enjoyment. They're missing God's good intent for them. They're just doing right to keep God happy. And they think wrongly when they imagine that they've done enough, when they keep the temple and the sacrifices going. Really, that's where they're at. The temple is going, God is happy. Now, moving on, how can we keep the people happy? See, that, I think, is the underlying theology in Judah. 
Those two things ought to be bound up together. The kings and indeed the people glorifying God and enjoying God. But while they sort of give God what he wants, they do something different then for the people. Azariah and Jotham, they give the people the high places. And in doing so, they simply do what is right according to public opinion. Verse 4, except that the high places were not removed, the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. We'll leave that be, because that will keep the people happy. And if they're happy, then they will keep us on the throne. They don't pursue reformation. They don't pursue full and true righteousness for the nation. That might be unpopular. That might even stir up rebellion. And they only have to look across the border into Israel and see what rebellion looks like. And so Azariah, he lets the people have what they want. They can do temple God happy and they can also do high place worship and that will keep themselves happy there's a real warning there for us already isn't there I mean it is an easy trap to, to fall into the trap of compartmentalizing our lives this will keep God happy this will keep me happy yes I'll do A, B and C for God but I'll do X, Y, and Z for myself or for my own. And in our pride, we might even imagine it's a win-win. But that sort of compartmentalization is not what God wants. He wants us to love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. His desire is that we find our satisfaction and our joy in him himself. And he knows, the Lord knows that we'll never really be happy unless we find that joy in him. So he made us, he has put eternity in our hearts. And only he can fill that. We'll never rest until we find our rest in him. I think that Judah are like the older son in the parable that Jesus taught, the parable of the prodigal son. They're doing the right thing. They're working hard to keep God happy. And yet all the while they're wanting to find their joy in something else. Listen to that older son in Luke 15 verse 29. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends no joy out of serving his father he failed to understand what the father told him in verse 31 of Luke 15 son you are always with me and all I have is yours enjoy it son like Judah that son got no joy out of living with his father no joy in all the blessings that were already his. Azariah in his pride, he just gave the people what they wanted. But he didn't give them, you know, the reformation that would have exposed his people to God's best. He just did what was right according to public opinion. And sadly, the public loved the high places. Azariah's pride is judged in verse 5. The Lord strikes him with leprosy. And he suffers that leprosy until he dies. And the author of Kings doesn't go into the specifics of that. But the full story is given in 2 Chronicles 26. And that chapter reveals that Azariah, or Uzziah, really did what was right according to his own mind. Chronicles 26. Just let me give you a bit of a summary of, of all the right that he was doing right in his own mind and a lot of it's good he made war with God's enemies he subdued whole nations 
he became exceedingly strong. He fortified Jerusalem. He put great weapons in the walls. He dug wells. He increased agricultural productivity. He amassed a great army. He became famous for his strength. He could do it all. He could even go into the temple and burn incense. So he thought. He thought he could actually worship God in the way that he thought was right and acceptable. That was too far. Burning incense in the temple, that was a task only for the priests and for the house of Aaron. And so God struck him. Leprosy. So that barred him from the temple forever. His pride came before a fall. And so we have his pride, and really uh, that's what we find in Jotham as well at the end of the, the chapter. Verse 34, he did what was right in God's eyes. That'll keep him happy. The high places remained. That'll keep the people happy. I looked up uh, the message just to, to read how it would put, you know, the, the, those high places. Uh, I think it's helpful for us to get a kind of handle on what's really going on there. Verse 35 in that paraphrase says, but he didn't, he didn't interfere with the traffic to the neighborhood sex and religion shrines. They continued as popular as ever. But he ticked the box for God, ticked the box here for the people, gave them what they wanted. Unlike his father before him, well, he did some good stuff too, according to his own mind. He did good things for Jerusalem, verse 35b. He built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. But once again, on that pride fell God's judgment. Yes, not in such a dramatic fashion as before. We simply read there in verse 37. In those days, the Lord began to send Razan, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, against Judah. Again, pride before the fall. Pride can come well disguised, as with both these kings of Judah, Azariah and Jotham. They did what was right in God's eyes. But really, that was the disguise. Underneath, there was this living to please others. And there was a desire to remain popular. Now, Jesus said in Luke 16, verse 13, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. See, pride will say, well, actually, I, I can. Pride will say, I can do that. You know, I can, I can give to God the things that are God's and I can give to myself the things that, you know, I'm due. I, I can do both. But it's a, it's a proud thing to say that. And it's a wrong thing to say that. Because you can't do it according to Jesus. Listen to him tonight. Please serve one master. Love the Lord your God and serve him only. Glorify God in all that you do. And enjoy God in all that you do. What would Jesus do? It's a good question. What has Jesus told me to do? It's a better question. Who will you serve tonight? Who will you serve tomorrow? Don't try following the path of Azariah and Jotham, trying to keep everybody happy. Follow the Lord Jesus. Then your joy will be full. But watch out for pride, because it comes in subtly and it divides the heart. And a divided heart ends up in a compartmentalized life. This bit for God, this bit for others, this bit for me. Do you see that happening? I mean, in your own heart. If you see it beginning to happen, that compartmentalization, quickly repent and return to the Lord Jesus. We need him. We want 
to say the same to the kings in Israel. But alas, they have turned their backs on the Lord their God. They are bent on living their lives without him. They simply want to reign on their own terms, and that brings utter chaos. And they're bound by sin. Their whole heart and life is one of prejudice and predisposition to sin. They can't stop sinning. And so secondly, we have this awful prejudice in the kings of Israel. Verse 8 down to verse 31, it's this awful predisposition to rebellion. These verses, they are a horrible catalogue of rebellion and sin. They just can't get out of it. They can't take themselves out of that muck. They're just wallowing in it. And it really does fall apart spectacularly with the rise of Shalom. Jehu's four-generation uh, dynasty is brought to a sudden end when evil king Zechariah is publicly executed by Shalom, who then takes the throne. Such is the beginning of this race through the kings. Let me race with you. King Shalom only reigns for one month, and then he's killed by Menahem, who then takes the throne. Menahem pushes the boundaries of wickedness even further when he savagely attacks his own citizens in Tipsa. He goes so far as to deliberately attack pregnant women. And his cruel regime lasts for a far too long ten years. He enlists the power of Assyria to strengthen his iron grip on his own nation, Israel. King Pul of Assyria comes up he comes up against Israel in verse 9. But Menahem, he bribes him. He becomes subservient to him. He squeezes the money for the bribe out of the wealthy of Israel. And to a certain degree it works. Because his cruel rule is not challenged. Nobody wants to take on him. Not with the cruel things he's doing. And so Menahem... He gets to die of natural causes and not by assassination. Verse 22, Pekahiah, his son, assumes the throne. He lasts for just two years before he is dispatched by one of his army generals called Pekah. He no doubt thought he was, he was safe. He's in the citadel of the king's house. He's got his two bodyguards with him there, Argob and Urea. But Pekah has 50 men. Pekah takes the throne. He reigns for 20 years, but Israel suffered greatly in his reign and lost a lot of territory. Uh, at the end of the last chapter, you know, it was being built up again, but now, no, it's, it's, it's all going. So much of it was lost to this new king of Assyria, Tiglath Pileser. Five northern towns were lost, and three regions Gilead, Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali. And what's worse still is that they just haven't come in and taken over. No, they have carried captives away from those places, taken captive into Assyria. And so something had to be done. Under Pekah, Israel is near to extinction. And the man for the job is Hoshea. And so he takes out Pekah, takes the throne. And unknown to King Hoshea, he will be the last king. Of Israel. Thousands of Israelites are enslaved by Assyria. But in truth, the whole nation of Israel is enslaved by sin. They cannot break free from it. They are fast bound by its power. It's not just among them. That prejudice to sin, it is in them. What is found in their evil kings, it's, it's found in the general population as well. And that awful refrain is repeated in verse 9, verse 18, verse 24, verse 28. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord as his fathers had done. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. And it goes on another three times the same stuff over and over again. The calf worship continues. The idolatry continues. The rebellion against the Lord God who rescued them out of Egypt continues. He brought them to the land of promise, but still the rebellion continues. The Lord has been gracious and patient 
and merciful over and over and over again, but they don't want them. God had given them a king. Oh, they begged for a king like the other nations. And sadly, they are just like the other nations. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, they made that request for a king. It displeased Samuel and it displeased the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. God said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. They just didn't want God to reign over them. What about you and I tonight? Do you, do you want the Lord to reign over you? Do you want Jesus to subdue you to himself? Do you want Jesus to rule and defend you? Do you want Jesus to restrain and conquer all his and your enemies? And if you're hesitating, what's the alternative? Because the only other alternative is that sin reigns. Since the fall of Adam, we are born sinners. It is the default of all our hearts. We may well imagine that, you know, I can do what I want. I can be my own king. I can be the captain of my own ship. I can be the master of my own destiny. But there's a problem with self. Self is already conquered by sin. And so it is. All have sin. All are slaves to sin. And we remain slaves to sin until we are set free by a better king, a stronger king, one who is able to defeat sin and the death that it results in. And Jesus, and only Jesus, is that better, stronger king. By nature, we're born prejudiced against him. Naturally, we don't want him to reign in our lives. We want to do what we want to do. But in his grace and mercy, King Jesus calls us to himself. And he calls us irresistibly by his grace. And he sends his Holy Spirit into our hearts and he grants us new life. Yes, we were dead in sins, but his Spirit comes and quickens us. And then we see Jesus as the King that we need. Can you see Jesus in that way tonight? Has he subdued you to himself? And if you're a Christian, then the answer is yes. Yes, he is. You're saying amen. And now you want more, more of that subduing. His grace has brought you new life. But you know, there are still parts of your life that need to be brought under that loving subjection and that gracious reign. But you want it. You want him to rule you and defend you. You want him to restrain and conquer that sin that's still clinging to your life. Because now, believer, now you feel that default prejudice to sin and you don't like it. You feel tempted to sin. And whereas before you ran with it thinking it would make you happy, now you see sin for what it really is. It's an enemy that will destroy you. You see, sin is that enemy that's trying to retake the throne of your heart. And you know that without Jesus, you'll lose that fight. Cry out to your king tonight. As the chorus goes, Lord, reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest hour. Because you are the Lord of all I am. And you reign in me again. Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Because you mean more to me than any earthly thing. Won't you reign in me again? The alternative to the reign of Jesus is the reign of sin. 
which ends in death and hell. Christ's reign, on the other hand, is life, life abundant and life everlasting. And so this sorry chapter of 2 Kings 15, it teaches us we need this better, stronger king because without him, we have no hope of freeing ourselves from that awful prejudice and bias to sin. Oh yes, it's with Jesus we have hope. And that hope rests upon the promises of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 25 promises that Jesus must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The promise is sure. And we see the trustworthiness of God's promises even here in 2 Kings chapter 15. That's our third point. We had pride and prejudice, but number three, we've got promises. Promises. Verse 12. This was the word of the Lord which he spoke to Jehu, saying, your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And so it was. What's just happened? Shalom has arrived in. He's killed King Zechariah. One evil king has killed another. But Zechariah was the fourth generation son in the line of King Jehu. Remember Jehu, 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 28 to 30. Let me read it to you. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. It starts off good. However, Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. That is, the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight, and have done to the house of Ahab, all that was in my heart, your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Now sadly, Jehu really wasn't interested at all in that promise. You know, that text goes on and he doesn't really care about what God says. He just carried on regardless. But the author of the book of Kings is interested in that promise. And he wants us to be interested in that promise too. He wants us to know that when God promises a succession of four generations, it will happen. It'll happen because God says it will happen. After Jehu, generation one, Jehoahaz. After Jehoahaz, generation two, Jehoash. After Jehoash, generation three, Jeroboam the second. After Jeroboam the second, generation four, Zechariah. After Zechariah, we're expecting a new one now. But it's not going to be his son. That dynasty is finished. Why? Because God made a promise. Four generations. Four generations only. And God's promise was kept. This was the word of the Lord. And so it was. Now if this promise of four generations was kept, it gives us good reason to be confident that another promise will also be kept. God's promise to David would be kept. God promised David back in 2 Samuel 7 verse 16. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. God made an amazing promise. An everlasting dynasty to David. And indeed that promise was fulfilled in just 28 generations. According to Matthew 1 verse 17. He says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Yes, once we come to Christ. The prophecy is fulfilled because he is the everlasting king. Born king of the Jews, what the wise men said. Recognized by Nathaniel in John 1 verse 49. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Crucified with the superscription above his head, the king of the Jews. 
foretold as the risen and ascended king of glory. Psalm 24, we sang it together. And hailed as the eternal king in Revelation 11, 15, where the loud voices in heaven proclaim, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And again, hailed as the king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19, verse 16. The word of the Lord has announced the Lord Jesus Christ is the final, eternal, and supreme king of all. And it is so. recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as the supreme king and I don't just mean you know do you accept do you accept the fact of Christ's ultimate kingship in a theological sense what I'm asking is have you bowed before him the sovereign and eternal king join in with John in Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6 and say of Jesus to him who has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to God to his God and Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever Amen this king he is coming soon promised it Revelation 22 21 surely I am coming quickly and the promise will certainly be fulfilled it will be so are you ready are you ready for the return of the king oh come to him acknowledge your pride confess your prejudice and believe his promise He is the wonderful king. He is the only saviour. He is the one who has loved us and raised us out of that pride and prejudice and muck of our sinful rebellion. There is no king like Jesus. And my prayer is that he would further subdue us to himself. That we would give up any notion of ruling and defending ourselves but rather gladly accept his loving rule his loving defence I pray that we would have that joy of seeing him restraining and conquering all his and my enemies, all our enemies and I pray that we'd live in faithful expectation his glorious return. Amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God in heaven, we thank you that your promises are yes and amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord God, that he is the final king and the forever king. Lord, we bow before you. We acknowledge that there is much of pride and prejudice and sin still about us. But Lord Jesus, we cry to you as the great king and the king who is able to wash us and to wash us in that way that only you can do, Lord Jesus, because you were slain for us. It is through your blood that we are made clean. It is through your death for us that we are forgiven and pardoned and truly subdued. And we ask, Lord God, that in Jesus' name we would know more of his reign in our day-to-day lives. Will you please forgive us, Lord God, for the way we do tend to compartmentalize our lives. And we have the
this part for you and this part for others and this part for ourselves. Show us your better way. Reign in us, Lord Jesus, that all of our heart would glorify you and that all of our heart would truly enjoy you. Reign in us, we pray, for your own name.